I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX. For more information, please visit us at PowerVanSolutions.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Victor Adair, co-founder of the Polar Futures Group. He's Senior Vice President and Derivatives Portfolio Manager at PI Financial in Vancouver. His website, PolarFuturesGroup.com. Welcome back to the show, Victor. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good to be back talking with you. During our last interview, you were very bullish on the U.S. dollar, especially because the currency markets were starting to realize that rising interest rates in the U.S. really are going to matter. I see the U.S. dollar has jumped the past month or so, so what do you think about the U.S. dollar now? Uh, well, the dollar index, the U.S. dollar index, is up about 4% since we talked last month. Uh, it's up about 7% from the three-and-a-half-year lows we made in February. And maybe to answer your question directly, yeah, I think the path of least resistance, let's say, is for the U.S. dollar to continue higher. Now, we've had a pretty good rally here the last two months or so, and I wouldn't be surprised, you know, that's the usual caveat, right, if we have a little backing and filling, maybe have a little correction. But uh, depending on your time frame, and maybe we'll get to that in just a sec, I, I think the U.S. dollar generally does better. When we talked uh, last month, I referred to what I called the stealth uh, s strength in the U.S. dollar against some currencies. And, I mean, there's a handful out there, and certainly the, the Argentinian peso, the Turkish lira, which are down between 25% and 20% or thereabouts, since we talked last, just in a month, uh, against the U.S. dollar. I noticed the other day that virtually everything, all of the currencies of all of the countries south of the Rio Grande are down against the U.S. dollar to various degrees, you know, 5%, 10%, 15%, that sort of thing, with the, the Argentinian peso being the weakest. So, um, you know, I, I make uh, comments every week about the markets and particularly about the currency markets and post them on what we call the trading desk notes on our website at the Polar Futures Group. And one of the things I noticed this past couple of weeks is the relationship between the euro currency and the Swiss franc. Now, folks may remember that in the period from, let's say, 2012 to early 2015, the euro was falling against the Swiss franc, or from the Swiss perspective, their currency was going straight up against the euro and making it very difficult for Swiss exporters to be competitive. So the Swiss National Bank sort of drew a line in the sand at 120 on a cross rate and said, we will print as many Swiss francs as we need to and deliver them into the market in exchange for euros to keep the Swiss franc from going straight up against the euro. Well, that carried on until like the beginning of January or middle of January 2015. And at that point, we had one of the most dramatic moments in foreign exchange trading in recent memory where the Swiss finally threw in the towel and the euro just fell like a stone in a day against the Swiss franc. Well, after they had pulled the peg, as we call it, the euro gradually crept a little higher, and particularly here in the last 15, 18 months, the euro has really gained against the Swiss franc. Now, I'm going on and on about this because the Swiss euro cross rate is a real good thermometer for how much, mm, call it, risk appetite there is in the world. So as the euro was rising against the U.S. dollar throughout 2017, it was also rising against the Swiss franc up until here about three weeks ago when the market really started to take what I'm calling uh, the political crisis in Italy seriously. Like this, this is an existential degree political crisis in Italy. You've got, the, it looks like the government may be formed from people 
who just want previous debts forgiven. They want Italy to just maybe break away from the euro. Remember, since the Second World War was over, and you know, and then the, let's say as we got things back on track in the early fifties, the Italians consistently devalued their currency against the Deutschmark so they could stay competitive. When they're within the euro framework, they can't do that. So Italy, in effect, is breaking down. And hence, that's why the people have voted this way. So watching what happens to the euro versus the Swiss, I think it's going to give us a, a real good feel for risk appetite out there in the world of foreign exchange trading. Do you think Italy will go back to the lira? You know, uh, Jimmy, that is the $64 zillion question. If Italy decides... They want out. Um, that's making it very simple. It's going to be really complicated, I imagine. But if they want out, then the whole structure of the euro, as we know it, has got to be reconfigured. Maybe, as my good friend Martin Mirnbiel has said for years, there should be a northern euro for countries like Germany, <clears throat> maybe Denmark, Holland, that sort of thing, and then a southern euro for the, let's call them the Mediterranean countries who you know, aren't, aren't quite as um, hard-nosed about fiscal policy, say, as, as the Germans are. We'll see. But it is it is a, a real big moment, and it's one of the things here, I think, the, the worry about what could happen to the euro that has caused the U.S. dollar to be uh, pushed higher or taken higher, particularly the last month or so. Gold has fallen about 35 to $40 since we talked last time and made new lows for the year this week. What do you think the U.S. dollar going up is going to do to the price of gold? Um, okay, generally, there's you know <laughs> the the biggest variable in determining the price of gold, you know, like from week to week, month to month, is the relative strength or weakness of the U.S. dollar. If you couple that with what we call real interest rates, in other words, the interest rate you get after you strip out the inflation rate, if real interest rates are rising and the U.S. dollar is rising, that is typically a real difficult environment for gold. I mean, we haven't had gold trade above $1,400 for five years. You know, we had a brutal bear market in gold and commodities generally from 2011, when gold was over $1,900 briefly, to the end of 2015, let's call it January of 16, when a lot of commodities bought them. During that period of time, gold fell about 900 bucks, uh, and, and that's against the dollar. When you look at gold relative to, let's say, the S&P 500 I index, I mean, gold has lost 70% of its value. I mean, it's like gold. It takes way more gold now to buy a unit of the S&P than it did, you know, in 2011. So, uh, I, and I would say one more thing about gold, just if I haven't <laughs> stuck enough pins in it, you know, the the real interest rate right now is at about a two-year high. And if we say, you know, where was gold when real interest rates were last at this level? Well, gold's 100 bucks lower. Okay, that's kind of the negative side for gold. The positive side is I could see gold doing better, going up, in other words, at the same time the dollar was going up, if gold was to find a, a safe haven bid. And I think we've, we've seen a little bit of that lately here with worries about the euro, about Italy, uh, that you know the gold market hasn't been beaten up, let's say, as much as it might have, given how, how dramatically the euro currency has fallen. There may also be another thing, and you and I talked about this with crude oil, uh, I think, last time. The As I just said, the relationship between gold and stocks is like gold's been slaughtered. Okay, but for people who have a longer-term time horizon, they may say, hey, we've made terrific money in the stock market here over the last nine years, uh, and gold's gone down. Uh, we can buy more gold with, you know, if we cash in our shares now than we ever could you know, in, uh, in, in years. So maybe we should rebalance. Now, this I'm talking about pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, that, that kind of many. So, you know, maybe that provides a, a bid for gold. And um, here, here's one other thing, Jim. I mean, you and I are, I'm assuming, we're of an age where we remember when gold was just so spectacular back in 1979, 1980. When, you know, I think we ran up to $850 an ounce. 
But that was 40 years ago. And, uh, you know, that memory just doesn't exist in the memory banks of anybody that's old, uh, less than 50 years of age. So, you know, maybe the kids today just really don't care about gold the way old timers do. We'll have more with Victor Adair right after the break. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Victor Adair. Victor, the Canadian dollar is just about exactly where it was a month ago in terms of the U.S. dollar. Does that mean the Canadian dollar has actually been rising against other currencies? Uh, well, actually, yes, it has. But, you know, to put that in perspective, <laughs> this is the, on the other hand, uh, in, in February and March of this year, the Canadian dollar was about the weakest currency in the world as the U.S. dollar was getting clobbered, Canada was getting clobbered even more. Uh, in that uh, two-month period, we fell from around 82 cents uh, versus the U.S. dollar to about 76 cents. So uh, as the U.S. dollar has strengthened here the past couple of months, in effect, it sort of you know pulled the Canada up with it. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll look at the cross rate, for instance, of Canada against yen, Canada against euro. And yes, Canada has been uh, relatively strong here the past couple of months. You know, we, I keep saying there's sort of three big things that determine the value of Canada. One is the relative strength or weakness of the U.S. dollar. Two is the interest rate spread between Canada and the United States. And three is commodities generally and specifically uh, crude oil. There's certainly a, a number of other things that will come to play from time to time. And NAFTA, you know, I mean, we're getting tired of hearing that word perhaps, but net, net, it's a drag on Canada. I mean, if if you and I are sitting on a board of directors somewhere, particularly if we're in the United States, and we're thinking, do we want to, you know, put some money into Canada, build a plant or something like that, or should we just go ahead, you know, and build it here in the United States? Given the uncertainties around NAFTA and the fiduciary responsibilities you have when you're sitting on a board, the safer choice is you build it in the States. So the, the, the longer the NAFTA negotiations drag along, you know, the more uncertainty there is, and I think that's a net drag on Canada. That's my view. Uh, then, you know, we have, like, pipeline issues, and that's just a euphorism for this bizarre goofiness that's going on. Uh, socialist governments from one end of the country to the other, virtually, I think we have two provinces that have got the more conservative governments. The, the troubles with uh, uh, housing, consumer debt, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, there's a number of factors at play with Canada. Now, one of the pluses, certainly, is the commodity market. And Canada, really, for the past five weeks or six weeks or so, has just kind of chopped sideways in a pretty narrow range sort of go on either side of uh, 78 cents. Uh, I have net lost money trading Canadian dollars over the past month just because every time I get short, the market seems to come back. And So right at the moment, I'm, I'm finding that there's uh, better things to do with my money than, than trade the Canadian dollar. We'll have more with Victor Adair right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp. Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold, including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, 
radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Victor Adair. Victor, the major U.S. stock uh, indexes are all a little higher than they were a month ago. Do you still think they could break down? Um, yes, I do. Uh, and uh, really, you know, we've had a nine-year bull market since uh, the what we call a great financial crisis in 08-09. Um, it's been 36 years since uh, what I think the bull market really started back in 1982 when the, the stock market found some footing and started to go higher as interest rates came down. I mean, during that same period of time, 35 years or so, we have seen uh, stocks rising and interest rates falling, and there has definitely been uh, a relationship there. Um, yeah, you know, the stocks are up, say, 300% from, the, the, that's the, when I say the stocks, I mean the S&P index up about 300% from the lows in 2009. Central banks, uh, the Fed and other central banks around the world have had uh, created a regime of ultra low interest rates, easy money, and I think that's underwritten a lot of this this run up. Uh, baby boomers have been huge buyers of the stock market. When I say that, I mean you know a little bit even pension funds and that they've gone from maybe a thirty percent weighting in stocks to something much higher. Uh, the amount of leverage being used is unprecedented. You know, people are borrowing money to buy stocks. Uh, and then there's just momentum. You know, the stock market's going up because it's going up. I thought that the break that, oh, and let's put it in this perspective. A- at some point, it's probably going to have a correction. Okay, so I thought the break that we had at the end of January, beginning of February this year, might have been the beginning of that. <clears throat> uh, and and we'll see. Since then, I have, my trading policy, I guess, has been to look for opportunities to get short if a rally back kind of runs out of steam and starts to roll over, then I get short. So that's how I've been trading it uh, on, you know, on a sort of a week-to-week basis, and that's what I think now about the stock market. Victor, crude oil's been trading around the $72 mark now for quite a while. Do you think it's going to go higher or just get stuck there? Uh, well, crude's been, uh, I'd say, way stronger than I had anticipated. I mean, over the last year or so, I mean, what was it, a, a year or so, we were around $42. Here we are touching 72 uh, And it's up 10% or so in the, in the last month. And when I use those figures, 42 and 72 I mean WTI. It's up 10% here the last month or so, uh, even though the U.S. dollar has been so strong. Some, clearly, there's a correlation between the relative strength and weakness of the dollar and, and the same with crude oil. I've described it, it as being a relentless bid in the market. It, it amazes me that, you know, the market has a little dip and then it just comes right back and makes new highs. So, you know, the, the question sort of is, why? <clears throat> and, I, and I have thought that it would be, it, it had to be more than just what I call OPEC and friends with their agreement to cut back production. It had to be more than that. Certainly, you know, the compliance of uh, OPEC to their targets has been like that they've, they've, they've over complied. And, but a big part of that is Venezuela just the falling off the face of the earth in terms of their ability to, to deliver on, on their allotment. Um, I think maybe of, of underestimated demand growth. I've, I've been very focused on the supply side and it seemed like there were you know, when we got into let's say 2016 and into 17, the the inventories that were visible around the world were bigger than they'd been on average over the last five years. So supply seemed to be the up the focus. Uh, lately, you know, the sanctions on Iran have got the bulls excited. Uh, on the other side, America, the, the United States, particularly because of the the the, the frackers. Their production's just going through the roof. They're now currently tied with Russia as the top producing country in the world, producing crude. I've wondered if there's been manipulation of the market. You know, I mean, everybody gets nervous about that word, but gee whiz, there's people, companies, and certainly countries out there that uh, have, a, have a, a real interest in seeing the price of crude oil get high. And then, like we talked about gold earlier, Jimmy, uh, you know, just that rebalancing effect that the price of crude relative to stocks is really, really cheap. So 
Maybe it's time to take some profits off the table in the stock market and and buy crude oil in, in some form or other. Certainly, a, a, what would they call a geopolitical risk premium is there. You know, maybe everybody, maybe we know all these things. So, you know, what are you going to do about it? Uh, I have had a bearish bias in crude because I made some really good money uh, being short of crude in 14 and 15. And uh, what I'm doing is I, I have shorted it and sometimes made a little bit of money, but more often than not, I get clipped out for a, a loss. And I am just watching it now, and I, I want to see more of a breakdown before I go back into the short side. Victor, thank you so much for chatting with us. Jimmy, it's a it's a pleasure. It's a, we never have enough time, but I just I kind of get going, and these are markets I love to talk about. So there you are. Thank you. My guest has been Victor Adair, co-founder of the Polar Futures Group. He's senior vice president and derivatives portfolio manager at PI Financial in Vancouver. His website polarfuturesgroup.com. If you have any questions for Victor or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.